in this area is ultimately because there's no silver bullet. You know, I, <laughs> I guess because I'm old, uh, oldish. Um, I have shoes already. Because <laughs> I've been been doing student ministry, I guess, for uh, 13 years since the dark days of 2005. I've dealt with as many sexting issues with flip phones as I have with smartphones. And one of my favorites is <coughs> kids that come up and they follow me on social media. I'm like, how did you follow me on social media? You don't even have a phone. You don't have a phone, period. They're like, oh, I just use my friend's phone. Mm -hmm. And so I say that to say, whatever you do, make your wisest decisions, but be intentional in discipleship. Even not allowing your kids to have a phone, period. You know, they just borrow their friend's phones and run their social media accounts through their friend's phones and post things through their friend's phones. You know, or grandma's phone. <laughs> grandma's. The grandma thing I've, I've run into more often. Parents come to me and they say, man, we protected everything and he was still getting into it. We couldn't figure out how until we checked mamma's cell phone. And then <laughs> either, <laughs> either mamma's, got, mamma's got some hobbies she didn't have before. <laughs> You know, she's been a widow for a while, but good night. So all that to say, to make light of it, but it, it really comes back to intentional discipleship. That's what the training is all about. It's not about the specific decisions you make as a family. We obviously do protect our kids, which is why that's the centerpiece of what we do. But in everything you do, be intentional in this area. And if you are just intentional, you're ahead of 80% of parents out there in the church <laughs> so even if you don't go home and implement all of this if you just take some steps to be intentional in this area it's going to make a huge difference it really is whatever you, you decide to do as a family and this last part here's what i probably the most important part is is, is this and it's the spiritual part so of course it's most important but at some point protections fail they just do um, and that's, at some point, protections fail. At some point, shelters shatter. And at that point, kids need the gospel. Um, First Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like, around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Once again, if our kids were neutral, if they were not sinners... Um, this would not be so hard. But they're not, they, they're not born blank slates that we nudge into goodness. They're born sinners that we drag into the light. And so because they are sinners, because evil is not just out there, it's an active force, because of that, we need to realize that at some point it's going to, it's going to break. It's going to shatter. I mean, oh gosh. Uh, you know, we, we, I've had, sexting situations with teenagers where a parent was furious. They were furious because some boy had been sexting their daughter um, and they wanted, they wanted a blood, right? Somebody needed to pay for this. Well, and then they, they took the daughter's phone and they, they recovered the text messages. They got a technology person to recover the text messages that had been sent. And what they discovered is their eighth grade daughter was not the angel they thought she was that she had actually been initiating much of that contact. And here was this whole time they thought, our daughter would never do that, she's innocent, this predator, this eighth grade predator came into our lives. And in truth, it's much more complicated than that. Um, goodness, the number of parents that have come and said to me, we thought this wouldn't happen to us, then we discover, and usually what they discover is not you wish it was, oh, you know, last week our kid did this. No, we discovered that um, at the age of 10, our kid began going online and, and doing these things. And uh, we discovered for two years. You know, I had a 13-year-old a, uh, come up to me after one message on David and Bathsheba talking about sexual things and said, Pastor Brian, I've been stuck in porn for five years. Addicted to porn for five years at 13. Um, and that's more and more common. And more and more parents are coming and, and saying, um, we didn't know, but this is what happened. And not just technology-wise, but worldwise, the things that... And, and, and whenever kids share with me 
a number of kids will come up and, and share, especially after I address these things with me, their stories, and most of the time their parents don't know. Um, or if they did, they didn't find out until much, much later. And so in the light of that, we just need to realize that's, what's, that's where we live. That's where we're at. I mean, there was a pastor at a church said, you know what, after my kid uh, graduated college, or maybe it was back after he graduated high school, he was in college, came to me and said, Dad, this has been a problem in my life for years. But I never told anybody, and he had no idea. He was for the church. Um, with that said, we it could go on and on with stories. And many of you could as well. And we just need to be aware of that. Um, we are not the exception. As much as maybe we wish to be. We hope we are, right? Gosh, would it be great if we could get through the, the technology in the world unscathed. But it's probably not going to happen. Um, and if you think you are, you may cause great harm to your kids. Uh, one example from the pornography realm. Um, when you view pornography, it releases a chemical in your brain called dopamine. It's the pleasure chemical. Um, it, it, it also gets released while surfing the internet. Right? That, that reward thing he was talking about. Right? Because what keeps us checking our phones for notifications that might be good, might be bad, is the dopamine release. We get whenever we get a good piece of information, a good email. Some of us are um, obsessive email checkers. We're just hopeful something good is going to come across there. We get, we'll get that dopamine release, that pleasure chemical. So when this happens to you at a young age, uh, neurologists have figured out that while the brain is being wired, which is what's happening especially when you're in middle school, um, but on into high school, it, I believe it doesn't really stop until you're in your early 20s. While your, ba your brain is being rewired, it's, it's like clay, right? You're <coughs> developing the mental pathways you're going to use for the rest of your life. And if you are into something like internet pornography or if you're constantly glued to your phone, you're, you're creating what neurologists call ruts in the brain. You're, you're creating chemical pathways in the brain that will not go away. Uh, they've done research on this. They found that when you take a teenager who's been exposed to, say, internet pornography, for a young age, and they've, they've done that. And you take a 40-year-old who gets started at, in their 40s. The 40-year-old is able to walk away. The person who started as a teenager isn't. Why? Because they've been neuro neurologically wired to need that dopamine release. Because it happened while their brains were still young and still forming. So parents who say, well, I hope it works out for the best, I'm not going to be intentional in this area, may be creating lifelong issues for their kids without even knowing it in the area of internet addiction or social media or video games or, you know, most importantly in pornography because the dopamine release is more significant. And so with that in mind, that's why we have got to just realize that we may not be the exception to this. And we need to be ready when that does happen. And the key when that does happen is to create a gospel culture in your home. Not a law culture, not a morality culture, a gospel culture in your home. Think prodigal son, Luke 15, classic example. The story of Luke 15, the younger son goes, he gets the inheritance from his father, he goes off and he squanders it in reckless living uh, with prostitutes, the older son says later, blows it, ends up in a, a pigsty feeding the pigs, says, you know what, how many of my dad's hired servants are living better than this? I'm going to go home and be one of his hired servants. And he goes home, and while he's a long way off, the father sees him, and he takes off running and embraces the son and welcomes him back. There's no consequences. You're back in the family. Put a robe on him. Put the family ring on him. You're going to be a son again. And that's the response that we need to have in our home when our kids fail in this area of Technology that begins when we as parents know and preach the gospel ourselves. And one way they see this is when we as parents are willing to repent to our kids. When we sin against them, when we do wrong that they see, we confess it, we ask forgiveness. They need to see that. They need to see us practicing that so we're not up on some high pedestal. Like, we don't need the gospel. The gospel's for those plebeians down there who don't have it all together. <laughs> Mom and dad don't have it together. Kids need to see that, right? They need to see that um, because that's, that's who we are. Um, in this area, that means we, we're not so consumed with protecting our kids that we forget to protect ourselves. 
that we're not, like the dad in the video, Will Ferrell, right? That everybody else has to put their phones in the basket, but I don't. You know, everybody else needs to have a user profile, but I don't with this software that I've just downloaded. And then also know now how you will respond then. Ephesians <clears throat> 6, 4, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You need to know now how you're going to respond to your kids when they come to you having failed in this area. If you get angry, you become a judgmental and vindictive father or mother in this case. Will they ever come to you with anything else? No. No, they will not. I've heard this story many times. It's an old story. But if you respond in wrath and in anger and in judgment, then they're just not going to come to you next time. They're just going to go on with their issues and on with their problems and say, well, I'm never going to tell mom and dad again. If you talk about how nasty and disgusting and vile it is, then they're going to think, well, I guess I'm nasty and disgusting and vile because I did this. Um, but if you welcome them like Jesus, uh, they will learn the gospel and they'll be willing to talk. I can tell mom and dad when I failed in this area. I can tell them when um, my social media activity has led to bullying. A lot of kids try to handle that on their own because they don't think their parents will respond well. well. I told you not to be on that. That kind of thing, you know. Uh, but if you welcome them and, they're, and the gospel is at the center of your home, they will be willing to talk. You know, when, whenever my kids, and we're not we're close, we're getting really painfully close with the first grader, when I, tell them whenever you see a picture of a naked person, <laughs> you come and tell me about it, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to have a party. Not because you saw it, but because you were willing to walk in repentance. Why am I going to do that? Because that's what the Bible says. I tell you, when one sinner repents, what happens? The angels in heaven rejoice. But there will be no rejoicing over pharisaical righteousness. Right? If heaven rejoices when a sinner repents, if the Father comes running, maybe we should rejoice at repentance, not at the sin, but at the repentance. We can, we can celebrate that you want to be free from this. Doesn't mean there's no consequences, right? The father disciplines those he loves. It does mean that if they're having a struggle with their phone, right? They're mentally depressed because of what's happening on social media. Maybe we need to take it away. We're just gonna we're gonna give you a three-month internet break. <laughs> right? They're, they're probably, I'm speaking here in older teenager terms versus younger children terms, okay? There may be consequences. That's not the same. Discipline, the father loves those he disciplines. Disciplines those he loves. But at the same time, we've got to create a gospel culture. When we mess up and fail, God doesn't come down and hit us with a bolt of lightning. He welcomes us as a loving father. He may discipline us to help us in the future, but ultimately, if we don't create that environment, our kids are not going to come to us. They're going to figure out, I've got to do this on my own. Right? So we've got to do that. We need to create a gospel culture. And if you're wondering what that looks like, just look at how Jesus handled sinners in the Bible. It's a great place to start. Um, so we welcome them. We celebrate their repentance. We help them. Because, again, the goal is intentional discipleship. We want them to become fully formed followers of Jesus. And fully formed followers of Jesus mess up. Again, and again sometimes, just read your Bible once again. Peter didn't always get it right. He denied the Heavenly Father. I mean, he denied Jesus. Listen, I don't know what your kid do, but did, but they did not deny Jesus to his face when he was going to the cross. And if Jesus can forgive that and restore that, then we can do the same with our kids. Um, Ted Tripp, who's a biblical counselor, said, Biblical discipline addresses behavior through addressing the heart. Remember, the heart determines behavior. If you address the heart biblically, the behavior will be impacted. I don't care if my kids are behaviorally perfect when they're in my home, when they're under my care for these 18 years that I have them. Because a lot of kids learn how to be behaviorally perfect with wicked hearts. Who cares? Who cares if your kid is perfect in technology, but they don't know Jesus? 
and their heart's not been changed by the gospel. Our goal as parents is to shape a kid's heart. And if we do that through training their heart to know and love the things of God, then guess what? They're going to be able to handle technology rightly. And if we don't, if we just teach them and say, by the law, by morality, these are the things that we do not do, or you will feel the weight of the law come down on you. You will get behavioral change, but it'll only be superficial. It'll all, and it will end as soon as they think they can get away with it, and it will end as soon as they are out from under your care. So our goal in everything we do as parents, but especially in their technology, is to form the hearts of our kids. And if we do that, then the area of technology will come into line as well. And so we need to do that. They need to know the seriousness of sin and the seriousness of grace. Both. This sin is evil. It is wicked. It is offensive to God. But while you are more sinful than you can imagine, you are also more loved than you can imagine. And those two things really change a life. When a kid knows, yes, I'm sinful. Yes, I've messed up. Yes, this is wrong. But the love that I have received is far greater than anything I've ever done. That changes a heart. That's what they need to know. Um, and they need help walking in repentance, parents. Okay? Uh, your kid messes up in this area. You come right alongside like the barnacle geese. We're going to walk this out together. Okay? We're, we're going to help you get out into safety. And so we need as parents to walk with them. Um, it breaks my heart because I know kids who have shared their struggles with their parents and said, well, they didn't help. They didn't do anything. I'm having a problem in this area, and the parent doesn't know what to do. They feel overwhelmed, but they're not going to take the time to learn, and so now the kid is left to fend for themselves. Don't be that parent. Help them walk. If their problem is social media is depressing them, help them figure out how to navigate that. If their problem is um, the text messages they're sending back and forth with friends, help them in that area. If their problem is all they want to do is play video games and they can't stop, help them with that. If their problem is pornography, help them with that. Um, if their problem is bullying, help them with that. Um, be there. Be their advocate. Help them to walk in repentance. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6 also says. And then also know what you're dealing with when it comes to your kids. Uh, some kids are broken and repentant. That's what we want. That's, that's a sign of a heart that's been changed by the gospel. I did this. I'm sorry. I want to change. That's what we hope for. Uh, angry and defiant. They're just mad they got caught. Your problem is not technology. Your problem is they, they don't know Jesus. <laughs> or they have seriously quelched the spirit of God. Their problem is deeper. Right? Give me a broken, repentant kid any day over somebody who is um, angry and defiant. But also concerning is unconcerned and apathetic. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. I don't care. Once again... Those are kids that know, that need to know Jesus. You gotta do gospel work in those cases. What we hope for is a kid who's broken and repentant about their sin. It's a great sign. It's a great sign. I want that, I'll take that. Rather than a kid who is unconcerned or apathetic or angry and defiant or doesn't see what the big deal was. You know, in that case, there needs to be some work in the word of God and in the gospel. Our goal at the end of the day, and I think, you know, you see this reflected throughout scripture is not kids who are trophies of innocence and behavior and good performance because that describes the Pharisees but kids who are trophies of his grace not kids that reflect our glory back to us which is secretly what we all kind of hope for but kids that reflect his glory back to him and his glory is seen not in behavioral perfection, but in the fullness of his grace that comes in and forgives and changes lives. Look what God has done in this life. Not look at what I have done as a parent to produce this perfect child, but look what God has done in the life of this kid to produce a kid who ultimately reflects his glory. This is the most important part at the end of the day because protection falls short, shelters shatter. But the grace of God redeems and restores. And if the kids get that, they'll turn out okay. If they don't, well, it could not end so well. Um, I was, um, we were walking with our kids down the street in the neighborhood there. And um, they were, 
I guess they would have been about almost three at the time. They were two and 11 months, our twins were, and our oldest was uh, five. And we're walking down the street and we said, okay, we're going on a walk, we're going to go visit some neighbors, but you need to hold our hand and not let go. You need to walk with us. That is the command. You cannot run free because there's cars and things like that. So we're walking down the road and we go visit a neighbor's house and we're talking to the neighbor, but one of our twins, Ben, he loves to run. All right, he's just got that natural, athletic, competitive spirit. He wants to break free and run, so he has been chafing under the law, right? He's been wiggling that hand around, trying to break free, but I've got that good grip. Well, in a moment, we were distracted. We're talking with a neighbor, with them, and Ben saw his moment of opportunity, and he wriggled that hand around, and he broke free, and he took off running down the road. Well, I turned, and I shouted the law to him, Ben, stop. Ben, come back. Ben, you have to stay with us. But all he did was turn around, look at us, and laugh. And he kept on running down the road until, with his short little legs, he ran into a crack in the street, tripped, fell down, and skinned his knees. And all of a sudden, that smile was turned upside down, and he began, the tears began flowing. He was hurting. Blood was coming. And he turned around, and he came running back to me. Now, in that moment, what did I do? Did I say, Ben, see what you did? You disobeyed. I'm not even going to deal with you. No, I didn't say that. They say, Ben, you messed up. You go fix it. You know where the band-aids are. You make it all better. No, I didn't do that either. Instead, I reached down. I picked him up. I held him close. Blood, tears and all, now getting on my shirt. I said, Ben, are you okay? Of course, he took out that lip and said, yeah. I said, Ben, do you want us to take it? You want me to take you home? And we'll make it all better. He said, yeah. And so we took him in and bandaged him up and fixed him up and said, all right, now let's play and have fun together. And when our kids break the law, when they mess up in this area and they run free, at some point when they trip and they get up and they come back to us, how we respond in that moment makes all the difference. When we stand there and say, you made this mess, you fix it or you broke the law, you deal with it, or will we scoop them up, blood, tears, and all that gets on us, <laughs> all their junk that gets on us, and when we say, are you okay? Can we make it better? That's our best moment as a parent, because that's what Jesus did for each and every one of us. And we can turn right around and do it for our kids in this area. Let me pray for you, and then if you guys have any last questions, um, I'll just hang out here. You can come up and ask me uh, whatever questions that you may have in this area. But it's definitely a, a place where we as the church and we as families can do better. And uh, I have a passion to see that happen. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, just for the folks that decided to give their Saturday morning.